as a human services block grant allows us greater flexibility, we do get separate allocations in each program area every year. And we, we have to stick to those allocations if we need to move money in between those funds and it's over 10% of a difference, we have to request approval from the state. Um, just a few things about last fiscal year uh, or the year that's just ending, June 30th. And that we're no different, um, still a lot of modifications in place, but a lot of the flexibilities that we've been experiencing over the last two years are really coming to an end. Um, the expiration of the public health emergency, we'll see, see to that. So some of the struggles that we've had, and I'll let Kathy speak to the drug and alcohol uh, situation as well, but um, really a lot of the program capacity that we have before still really continues to be an issue, especially um, in our developmental disability program. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about drug and alcohol. Or... Um, we, can, we continue to have problems with staffing drug and alcohol. Um, hopefully the opioid settlement funds will be helpful to that, but we continue to have that problem. Thank you. Uh, one of the other big issues is medical assistance, eligibility, and redeterminations were really put on hold throughout this whole pandemic, um, and now that's coming to an end. So, you know, we're also fearful that people who don't understand that they haven't had to meet that requirement over the last couple of years are not going to do what's needed in terms of um, submitting all their paperwork. And we're, you know, we're worried and talking with providers all the time about making sure they're reminding people that they need to comply. The other big issue for all of us, and I'm sure for, for Kathy and the drug and alcohol system as well, is just really living is, is expensive and has really changed since the pandemic. So affordable rent is, is a huge concern for us, and that's not necessarily something that we can fix or change, but it's definitely part of what we run into when we're trying to support people. Um, some of the things that, we, that we've done, um, different funding streams, including um, our relationship with Community Care Behavioral Health, who's our managed care organization, and also some of the things that we've looked at, um, our DHS funding sources have really tried to utilize alternative payment arrangements to try to keep our provider network as in place as possible, um, just from a financial perspective. And I would say, even with that, as Kathy indicated, we still have many workforce issues that were um, trying to work around. This year for us, we also had a major change in terms of the crisis intervention provider. Um, and the other thing that's a brand new service for us that just started in April uh, that we added to our continuum was crisis residential services. And, and both of those are provided through Holcomb. Again, as I mentioned just a couple seconds ago, um, service capacity still continues to be an issue for us in, in many different levels of care. And then one other big issue for us that we can never really plan for and happened this year um, was uh, the incident with Palmer and the deployment of the emergency behavioral health team, which operates out of our office, but Michelle from our office coordinates with a lot of different volunteers who are on our team to assist when we have those kind of deployments. So the reason we're here um, every year there is a consolidated planning process for the block grant, which occurs, and that's why we are having the public hearing today. And uh, there's a team of different professionals who work on this planning process and work on the template that we actually have to submit to the state. So listed are the um, different members of our leader, leadership team, the Council on Chemical Abuse, different representatives of the developmental disability community, the mental health community, our health choices program, the homeless assistance program. Um, we work closely with the homeless coalition to gather all the information that's needed as part of this, this uh, planning process. And I will say, I mean, this is the time of the year when we formally work on the plan, but all year long, we're all gathering information about what our service system needs are and what our gaps are. Um, our year is just about to end at the end of this month. And so our fiscal forecast for our block grant is that we will uh, have some excess funding that we may need to return to the state. And I will say that that is a little deceiving in that um, I think part of the reason that we do have excess money is again, because we don't have the system capacity 
Um, so we we start out every new fiscal year with budgets and providers, and we look at what the trends were from the prior year, and we try to plan for what we're going to need. And then as the year unfolds, uh, maybe they didn't have the staff to provide the service. Maybe people just weren't as engaged. So um, we will have some money likely to return. Oops, I missed that slide. So um, this is, and I'm not going to go through this, but this this just shows the different areas um, in terms of how our funding is utilized, the breakdown between mental health and developmental disabilities, and all the different services that we utilize this funding to support. And then this is one of the other areas, the Human Service Development Fund. Um, it's it's not a whole lot of money, but actually that money goes and supports a lot of different programs and, and a lot of different services. So they're indicated as well. And the other funding stream is Homeless Assistance Program. Uh, again, not a whole lot of money, but used to support a lot of different programs. And I'm going to turn it over to Kathy. Thank you, Pam. Um, so the BHSI or the Behavior Health Special Initiative and Act 152 are the funds in the block grant that support drug and alcohol services. As the single county authority for drug and alcohol programs, the Council on Chemical Abuse manages this portion of the block grant. And you can see that through the different funding streams, COCA had almost $1.5 million in fiscal year 21-22 to help support the full continuum of drug and alcohol services, including prevention, treatment, intervention, and recovery support. Um, I'd like to call your attention to the number of drug and alcohol services provided in fiscal year 21-22 at the bottom of the slide. Um, this is a big number. And I want to note that this number is not all people or individuals served. A great deal of it is prevention messages that and campaigns that COCA provided during the fiscal year, including messages on our website, social media, brochures, and educational program. This number also includes 275 people who received treatment services, including withdrawal management, residential treatment, and outpatient, as well as over 1,000 people who received recovery support services. So I know I don't have to tell this Board of Commissioners that we still have an opioid crisis in Berks County. I know that you know that. In 2022, there was 151 overdose deaths in Berks County, which is a record high. The funding in the block grant helped COCA in partnership with SOS Berks to continue our strategies to reduce fatal, fatal overdoses. Um, we continue to distribute Narcan to first responders, schools, agencies, and community individuals. And in fiscal year 21-22, we distributed more than 2,500 Narcan kits. Um, the Drexel medical students have taken on the distribution of Narcan as one of their projects, and we supply them with Narcan for street outreach. Uh, the Community Safety Committee of SOS Berks also is doing street outreach with plans to partner with Helping Harvest to distribute Narcan during their mobile markets. Um, we have recently hired a new harm reduction coordinator with the goal of getting more Narcan into our community by targeting doctor's offices and businesses and offering more education. Um, we've recently started to distribute, distribute fentanyl test strips and started with our providers. In the past couple of months, we've already handed out over 800 fentanyl test strips. When our new harm reduction coordinator begins in July, we plan to expand the distribution of fentanyl testing strips as well as start um, distributing xylazine test strips. We continue to support the very strong warm handoff program at the Reading Hospital. And as you know, this is a service for overdose survivors and others with a substance use disorder who present to the emergency room. A recovery support specialist who is a person with lived experience, someone who is in long-term recovery, um, meets with a person to talk to them about treatment options with the goal of getting that person to treatment as soon as they are medically cleared. In fiscal year 21-22, there were 867 warm handoff services at the Reading Hospital, and those who were medically clear, um, about 70% of them accepted a treatment 
referral. And so in conclusion, the block grant funding is vital in helping COCA to provide comprehensive drug and alcohol services. Thank you. Uh, so as I mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, we do get separate allocations in if each of the different funding streams that go into the block grant. And um, if we want to move funds from one source to another, we do have to ask for uh, permission for that. But we had a minimal reallocation this year from mental health to the human service development funded areas. When we do have leftover funds from the prior year, one of the things that the state allows us to do is they will allow us to submit plans for how to use some of those funds. The one caveat with retained earnings funds is that you really can't support anything long term. You can't you can't start a service and continue um, to fund it utilizing these service dollars because you're never really sure from year to year if you're going to have any money left over. So typically at the end of the year um, when we're looking at if we have uh, additional resources left to what we can do. We try to figure out um, things that maybe we we wouldn't normally fund otherwise. So for example, um, one of the things that we did last year is we um, used some of our resources to supplement um, a housing program that we have uh, that provides some rental and utility assistance to individuals with mental illness or substance abuse issues. We also uh, funded loss team and we've been very focused on this with our suicide prevention task force. Um, we do a lot to try to get the word out about suicide and um, try to work with situations, but we don't, really didn't have a mechanism or something uh, in terms of responding to those situations, family members, uh, friends who are, are left behind after situations. So the loss team, um, we sent individuals from the Greater Reading Mental Health Alliance to be trained to be able to respond and support families after a situation where there's a suicide. Uh, we also use some retained earnings funds for uh, supporting, fa uh, supporting Families Collaborative, which is a IDD focused collaborative group. And then the other thing that we typically do with any money left over is we really try to fund some suicide prevention activities, try to get the word out in the community about stigma, we uh, do a lot of public service announcements. We've done, we actually just had our baseball game two weeks ago. And this morning, it was interesting. We were actually uh, talking about mental health first aid trainings. We, we've funded a lot of mental health trainings, not only for internal county employees, but also community members. Not that long ago, we did a mental health first training, first aid training at the Hope Rescue Mission. And actually tomorrow we're doing one for our MDH, MDJs. Did I mess it up? There we go. Um, and the other thing that we did this year was we actually, um, with the, the changeover with crisis, we, we did some startup costs for our new crisis provider and also some startup costs for our new crisis residential program. Uh, CIT activity, that's crisis intervention training, and that's specifically dedicated towards working and supporting police in terms of mental health. Um, so we actually paid for our forensic diversion specialists to uh, attend statewide CIT training. And we were actually uh, just found out that we received a CIT grant from the state. So we're gonna get that program up and running and hope to uh, have even more collaboration with our local police departments. Um, our forensic diversion program, we use some of these funds also to relocate our diversionary services from one provider to another. And then we also use some of these dollars um, to support some mindfulness training in the different school districts throughout the, the county. So now getting to some of the highlights in the plan that we submitted last year, some of the things that uh, we we included and the state recognized is that we in Berks County have a pretty comprehensive and well-funded reinvestment housing plan. We do have a comprehensive continuum of services available to people in need of those. We focused a lot of attention over the years, especially on transition age youth. Those are our young adults, 16 to 25, who often struggle uh, when they're transitioning out of youth focused services into adult services. Um, we also have outpatient mental health clinics in all of our school districts and our community colleges, and then um, MAT access 
opioid task force um, system, our system needs. And, and again, this is the part where we try to collect information, identify those areas that we see as gaps and hope that if we have any additional resources available that we can start to work on some of those. So um, one of the things that we noted last year, we could start that service up. Extended acute services are for, uh, it's an in-between for people who have uh, pretty acute psychiatric needs, but they're beyond an inpatient hospitalization and we're trying to prevent this. Another thing that we we don't have any direct responsibility over, but we often frequently are trying to coordinate and um, work with people who need access is Medicare. Um, that's not, we, we don't control that network, but we have a lot of individuals who need services and there are no providers. So we're always working with providers to try to get them interested in providing service. Um, and then the other thing that we've identified is uh, to try to have more service providers who can work with people that are both mentally ill and have substance use disorders. So again, some forward considerations as we uh, work on our plan for this year. Again, you know, trying to ide identify the uh, program gaps that we have. That's part of what we do during these planning processes. We want to hear from people. We have our perception, but maybe other people have information that they can share about things that maybe we're not picking up on. The one huge issue for us that will continue is just really workforce development. Um, we know that uh, a lot of our providers are struggling to hire and retain workers um, in this field. Um, so that that's going to be an area that we have to continue to to focus on. And and one of the things that I always say, and I don't really like to complain, but our at least on our block grant side, our funds have really been flatlined for a number of years. Um, there was a, a 10 percent reduction. I believe that was back in 2012. Um, and we've never been restored to that amount and we've been flatlined ever since. So it's really hard. You know, you, we say these planning processes are almost bittersweet because you're trying to identify you try to identify service gaps. But if you don't have any new funding to really address them, it's almost kind of like rubbing salt in a wound. Um, and, and we're working with our retained earning plans that we had from last year. And again, because we do anticipate that we will have some leftover money this year, we'll be doing the same thing going forward. But those are really one time only kinds of funding situations. So that's it for me, Kathy. I don't know if you have any other comments. Um, I just did want to mention, I forgot to mention that we are working on uh, providing a more robust a uh, warm handoff service at St. Joseph Hospital. Right now it's kind of like an on-call service, um, but using opioid settlement funds, uh, we hope to get a recovery support specialist there in their ER at, at least part of the day. They don't have the volume that Reading has that we would do day or part of the evening, whatever kind of makes sense for the hospital. So contact information is listed there. Um, please feel free to reach out if if you have any comments, suggestions uh, for us to include in our in our plan. And I don't know if I can't tell. Are there any questions or any comments? Nothing online, Marcia Helnick. Sure. I have some comments and questions. First of all, thank you very much, Pam and Kathy, and thank you to uh, your teams um, that work uh, hard day in and day out who are um, public facing um, and providing these direct services. Um, as we see, they are extremely critical for us here in Berks County. Um, and, you know, on slide three, where you're outlining uh, really kind of your highlights of what you focused on, um, it matches up to, you know, what the state is focused on. So I know a few months ago, um, Accurate Acting Secretary uh, Val Arkush from the Department of Human Services was here, and it was really just a media, you know, a campaign to um, do public awareness to um, the Medicaid assistance and the fact that it's not ongoing. You must re-enroll, um, and how many people that will catch or affect if they don't do that. Um, and then, you know, the advocacy of pennies. So you are on point uh, with what you're doing regarding the uh, capacity capacity issue and staffing. I do think workforce development is directly tied to that and you've acknowledged that. So I hope to see an improvement there for you because we never want to give money back, do we? Right? These excess of funds, <laughs> um, you know, if it's due to capacity, that's it. And I guess my question is how much 
How much are we returning at this point? Well, I mean, at this point, we our year doesn't end till June 30th, mm -hmm. so we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. And our I E will take a couple months after that. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. It could be as much as Steve four four five hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Right. Well, you know, even five dollars could be too much, depending on what we need, right, for services that we provide. And I think it's a slippery slope because, like you said, then you know, how do you um, account for these one-time program investments or infusions that you could do? Um, but we we don't know until after the fact. So the timing of that, I think, is inconsiderate for for what you need to do with planning. Um, but I wondered if uh, there was a component you spoke to with the Palmer incident. Uh, what was that? Emergency, Emergency behavioral health. health. Um, you know, could that be somewhere to revisit both in the next 10 days, right? June 30th is <laughs> around the corner um, to infuse any of those funds that are left for ongoing PTSD, you know, ongoing needs of anybody that you previously had served or touched once that happened. I think one of the difficulties with, with us in terms of who we do provide support to doing treatment, we do have requirements that we have to meet in terms of liability. Mm -hmm. You have to use other insurance programs first. So things like that are all things that we have to work through. And I will say our behavioral, the, the team that responds, those are all volunteers. Again, people mm -hmm. that work in the, the field and um, you have to go through a credentialing process. There are specific trainings that you have to take. So only those people who have actually completed the trainings can participate on, on that team. That's one of the things that Michelle has from our office has worked really hard on because uh, there was some change over in the state over the last two years in terms of that focus. And we lost, we lost a lot of volunteer team members because um, the trainings, if you didn't have your copies of your certificates, you, you needed to commit to taking all those trainings again, mm -hmm. which for a lot of professionals and other people, you know, if you have a full time job doing this is on top of that. So, I mean, ag again, I don't know that that requires any money in terms of trying to continue to seek out those individuals, but anyone who really has continuing needs can always reach out to our office. And even if we are not the payer, or we're not we're not the organization that's going to support it. We'll still do our job in terms of trying to link people to the right resources or help them work through uh, any kind of issues that they're having in terms of, you know, if you have insurance plans sometimes that can be cumbersome. You don't know who to talk to, right? Trying to figure out who's in your network. So that's always something that we're happy to try to help with. And that's critical. I'm glad that we're um, re-emphasizing that to the community who's listening. Um, I just want to take a minute to continue to support the warm handoff program. I'm very familiar with that. Um, I do believe that if uh, the, the recovery specialist, I know that's not the right title, but the intervention specialists were not there at that time. I think 70% is a pretty high rate of giving people the option immediately in the most acute time but uh, possibly in what they're experiencing um that that wouldn't be a success i think we'd see a lot more that number would increase in terms of the people who are suffering from um from those crises so i hope that you are able to continue that um, both at Reading Hospital, where I know it's been successful, and the potential of a pilot at St. Joe's. The last thing that is a question to me, I think it is intrinsically tied to some of the work that you spoke towards with suicide prevention, um, is gun violence. And so maybe when you're talking about gaps, um, you know, and, and looking towards the future, uh, can you speak to gun violence? Does, does that weigh in on your programming and what you do? Well, certainly one of the things that we look at um, in terms of our suicide prevention activities is, and, and we collaborate with the coroner's office is, you know, what was the situation? Who were who were the people that um, this impacted? So we look at things like age, method, um, situations like married, divorce. So, so we look at all that information and that's some of how it is that we actually focus our prevention activities because consistently over the years, I think our, our largest impact with suicides is older males mm -hmm. and it's typically by gun. Mm -hmm. So again, those are some of the areas that we try to focus around. Like who do we reach out to? And we we've, we've struggled a lot with our suicide prevention task force. Like do we do we go to Cabela's or mm -hmm. another place where you know they're mm -hmm. actually selling firearms? Mm -hmm. We actually have gun locks that we can give to people. So mm -hmm. trying to get that mm -hmm. uh, information out and and again, I mean, one of the things that we typically do, and, and actually Kathy and I are working on a um, a group that will actually look at both 
opioid deaths and, and suicide deaths and mm -hmm. try to sort of post postmortem mm -hmm. circle back around to what happened. What do we know about those situ situations? But um, as we get that information, we check the databases that we have. And a lot of times there are individuals that we don't know who right. we don't see have access service. So I think that's why the public messaging is so important, mm -hmm. you know, trying to let people know that there are other options. And I know Olivia from our crisis intervention providers here. Again, they're they're dealing with situations and families all the time to try to get in front of that. But obviously, we still have suicide, so it's still it's still an issue, and and guns certainly play a part of that. Well, thank you, thank you for uh, your good and hard work, and may it continue. Thank you, Pam and Kathy. Thank you uh, for the work that you do. I know throughout the years, although the funding has stayed the same, the what you can do is less because as costs go up, costs increase, uh, the same amount of money gives you less buying power. Apart from that, less staffing as well makes it just harder to do the same amount or more work with what you have. So something that's important to clarify, which I know you did and Commissioner Sahelnik did as well, but uh, when you talk about the uh, retained earnings or leftover funds, giving it back uh, to the state, it doesn't mean that there isn't a need out there. Uh, for programming and for services, but we just don't have either the staffing or the other resources needed to be able to implement the programs and make use of that money. So it's not that there isn't a need, but it, there's things out of our control that don't allow us to use that money in the way it's established by the state to be able to spend it all. And I'll give you one example. So um, one of the things that we use that funding for is individuals who need an involuntary hospitalization and they don't they don't have insurance coverage. So that's not something like we can look at how things were in the prior year. We try to plan, we try to put money aside. But if you have one one person that has a significant hospitalization, I mean, that can easily take up twenty to thirty thousand mm. dollars for you know a couple of weeks of being in the hospital. So you have to plan for those events because those are things that we are required by law to handle. So those are the kinds of situations sometimes that you, you make your best efforts at mm. trying to anticipate what's going to happen, but you don't really know because you can't really control any yeah. of that. So I mean, we we do look at the funding ongoing, try to move things around, try mm -hmm. to decide um, you know where we can take from one place to maybe beef up another place. But um, again, I mean, the other thing is providers too are dealing with the same issue. You know, they're yep. thinking they're going to use the money and then maybe a staff person mm. resigns right. or whatever. So you're not drawing down or billing as much as you have planned. Yeah. And apart, you're also dealing with the stigma of mental health, which is very real out there. Uh, so you're also fighting against that also. So thank you for the work you do, uh, Pam and Kathy as well, your your teams also. Thank you for the work that that they do day in and out around uh, these type of important issues that I think nowadays are even more important and more concerning than ever. So thank you. Thanks. So I will open it up to public comments. Are there any public comments in reference to the uh, MHCD uh, Human Services Block Grant? Okay, seeing that there are no comments, I will uh, Ask for a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the execution of Appendix A, fiscal year 2023-2024 County Human Services Plan Assurance of Compliance Form. So moved. I will second that. And uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? None. The resolution passes. And with that, then I will now close the public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Kathy, and thank you for your team that were here supporting you as well. We'll now move on to our next item in the meeting, which is a presentation by Peter T. Edelman from Stevens and Lee. And he will be, uh, he's here to present on the Albright College in connection with a proposed issuance by the Berks County Municipal Authority of one or more series of tax exempt and taxable revenue bonds. And Stevens Lee is uh, counsel to Albright. So welcome. Good morning. Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Uh, as noted, I am here today on behalf of Albright College. They are considering a plan uh, to issue one or more series of tax exempt and taxable bonds in an amount not to exceed $75 million. 
the proceeds of which are to be used to refinance and restructure some of their existing indebtedness, uh, as well as fund certain capital improvement projects on campus. Uh, those capital improvement projects include uh, the renovation and rehabilitation of the library, as well as the construction of an e-sports facility. The bonds are expected to be issued by the Berks County Municipal Authority as a conduit issuer. Um, and as part of the issuance of any series of tax exempt bonds that benefit a private entity like the college, um, the college is first required to conduct a public hearing uh, to provide an opportunity for members of the community to ask questions or comment about the project and then uh, approach the commissioners uh, to receive their approval for the project. So the hearing was conducted earlier this month by the Berks County Municipal Authority. Uh, there were no members of the public present to, answer, to ask any questions. So the second part of this public approval process then is to present this resolution to the board for your consideration. There's really two key parts of this uh, resolution that you have before you. Uh, the first is a state law finding that the project would benefit the health, safety and welfare of the community. And certainly uh, the educational um, programs presented by the by the college satisfy that requirement. And the second part is uh, a federal requirement that I've mentioned to you, and that is uh, just obtaining the approval of the highest elected officials in the in the municipality in which the project's located. Um, your approval does not bind the county in any way to the repayment of the debt. Uh, it's really merely just uh, an acknowledgement and an approval of the project and the issuance of the bonds to finance the project on behalf of the college. Um, this is a, a, a process that you've done many times in the past for other charitable organizations here in Berks County. Uh, so I'll stop right there to see if you have any questions. Uh, no questions per se. I think the only question I had, which you answered, was 75 million. <laughs> so um, I think what is very um, important for the public to understand is what you have outlined um, very clearly. Uh, you know, why are we here? Who is the Berks County Municipal Authority? What is the purpose or intent? Um, and again, that it is for the health, safety, and welfare of the people. We're lucky to have five. Um, you know, uh, institutions, should I say, of higher education, Albright being one of them, and the pursuance of this, um, these bonds for the capital, you know, projects that you've outlined um, is to continue that strength for us as a county. Um, so you answered my question. So just some good comments on um, the clarity that you've provided. Sure, thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter. And just to clarify, we have six institutions of higher oh. education, uh, direct, so. Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes. So, but so thank you, Peter. Uh, great information here, and also as just to reemphasize, as you had mentioned, also this puts no requirement on the county or no liability on the county uh, to repay these debts in case anything would happen. But there's a great opportunity for Albright to continue its great work up in that area there on 13th Street in Reading. Right. Thank you. Thanks again. So I will ask for a motion to adopt a resolution authorizing the Board of Commissioners of the County of Berks, Pennsylvania to approve the financing by the Berks County Municipal Authority of a project for the benefit of Albright College, declaring that it is desirable for the health, safety and welfare of the people in the area served by Albright College for the authority to participate in the financing of the project authorizing the approval of the project for federal internal revenue code purposes and authorizing other necessary and appropriate action. So moved. I will second that motion. Uh, do we have any questions or comments? Maybe just one, just mm -hmm. a clarifying point that, you know, that the taxable bond, typically this is a taxable, taxable bond, uh, if uh, Albright were to pursue this, so um, the opportunity here um, by using the municipal authority is to allow that tax exemption. So I think that's a good point to, to put out there. Okay, all right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Okay, the motion passage. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Best of luck. Moving on uh, with the meeting, we have our approval of minutes of the June 6 meeting minutes. Are there any changes, corrections, or additions to the minutes? If not, the minutes stand approved as presented. Now moving on, we will do the notice of public comment, which I will hand the microphone over to my executive assistant, Barbara Lopez. Public comment will be accepted in person and through the Q&A function. Please include your first name, last name, and municipality for all comments. Any comments without name and municipality will not be considered. Each citizen can submit one comment. Comment length is dictated by limitations of the platform being used, Teams Q&A, Facebook, and YouTube. In-person comments will be accepted first, followed by comments submitted virtually. The meeting comment period is limited to a total of 30 minutes, including both in-person and virtual comments. This time period may be extended at the discretion of the board. Please be concise. Comments that are germane to county business will be read during the meeting and should not be considered to be interactive dialogue with the commissioners. The county solicitor shall be the final arbiter of whether a comment is germane and should be read. Any commissioner response to public comment will be done at the discretion of the commissioners. Okay, thank you very much, Barbara. Uh, there are no public comment uh, in person and there are no public comments online either in reference to the agenda items. So moving along, uh, we had executive sessions. We had four executive sessions since our last meeting. Uh, one was on June 6th, which dealt with personnel. One was on June 7th, which dealt with personnel. One was on June 14th, which dealt with personnel. And one was on June 19th, which dealt with personnel, contract negotiations, litigation, and real estate. The agenda items, item number one for the budget department, adopt a resolution authorizing 2022 transfers in the amount of $22,293, dollars 2023 transfers in the amount of $142,891, and 2023 appropriations in the amount of $1,153,331 per listing dated June 16 of 20. 23. Under human resources, adopt a resolution authorizing human resources recommendations dated June 22nd, 2023, as follows. Authorize the appointment of Neshlari Iraola to Human Resources Assistant, Human Resources Department, effective 628 of 2023. Number two, authorize the appointment of Jose Negroes to Sergeant Jail System, effective June 28, 2023. Item number three, authorize the promotion of Catherine Lehman from Assistant District Attorney 4 to Supervising Attorney, District Attorney's Office, effective June 2nd of 2023. Authorize the promotion of Daniel Troy from Assistant District Attorney 4 to Supervising Attorney, District Attorney's Office, effective June 2nd of 2023. Item number five, authorize the promotion of Michelle Fisher from County Caseworker 2 to County Caseworker Supervisor 1, Children and Youth Services, effective June 16, 2023. Item number six, authorize the promotion of Ashley Esposito from Guardian at Lightham to Supervising Attorney, Guardian at Lightham, Court Administration, effective June 2nd, 2023. Item number seven, authorize the promotion of Colleen Painter from Human Services Assistant to Payroll Analyst, Human Resources Department, effective July 5th of 2023. Item number eight, authorize the promotion of Brandon Clinton from County Caseworker Supervisor 1 to Manager of Intake Services Children and New Services, effective July 5th of 2023. Item number nine, authorize the appointment of Stephanie Williams to Interim Library System Administrator, County Library Systems, effective June 21, 
23, and this is due to the resignation of Amy Lesh, who was the uh, library systems administrator. Item number 10, authorize the utiliz utilization of a temporary agency for two data entry clerk positions, treasurer's office, effective July 17, 2023 through September 1st, 2023. And these position positions are requested to assist with the increase in data entry associated with the annual processing of hunting licenses. Under purchasing, Item A, adopt a resolution authorizing a, a recommendation to award and the Director of Contracts and Procurement to execute as a result of the invitation to bid number 23-12-GR for contract for the Berks County Agricultural Center facility upgrades phase one project as identified herein. One, contract general construction, Balton Construction Inc. Total bid not to exceed amount for general construction, $4,418,000. Number two, contract plumbing construction, Vision Mechanical Inc. Dollars. Number three, contract HVAC construction, the Warco Group. Total bid not to exceed amount for HVAC construction, $1,459,570. Number and item number four is the contract for the electrical construction, IB Able Inc. Total bid not to exceed amount for electrical construction, $916,164. Item B. Oh, did I say? Oh, I'm sorry, $914,164. Thank you. Uh, item B, adopt a resolution authorizing a recommendation to award and director of contracts and procurement to execute a one-year contract as a result of the request for proposal number 23-06-GR for employment, advancement, and retention network earn services as follows. Educational Data Systems, Inc., not to total not to exceed $1,113,000. $155.60 for fiscal year July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. The allocation amount for the additional program year shall be reestablished annually via written amendment. Item C, adopt a resolution authorizing a recommendation to award and director of contracts and procurement to execute six agreements as a result of ITP number 23-11-NC, food provisions for a period of one year for the jail system and Berksheim as follows. Number one, Beambo Bakeries USA Inc. estimated annual expenditures of $184,077.54. Number two, Clover Farms Dairy LLC estimated annual expenditures $14,600 and 43 cents. Number three, Good Source Solutions, estimated annual expenditures, $259,113.76. Number four, Hershey's Ice Cream, estimated annual expenditures, $14,150.11. Number five, Food School Lore Inc., estimated annual expenditure, $713,188 and 36 cents. Under Commissioner Rivera, adopt a resolution amending resolution number 139-2023 to reflect the reappointment of Michael Toledo, Blandon, Pennsylvania to the Schuylkill River Passenger Rail Authority Technical Committee for a three-year term expiring on June 30, 2026. And this is here because the original resolution was done for two years rather than three years, which uh, it calls for. Under commissioners, item A, adopt a resolution authorizing the Berks County Solid Waste Authority on behalf of Berks County to apply for the 904 Municipal Recycling Program Performance Grant to the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Bureau of Waste Management for calendar year 2022. Item B, Adopt a resolution authorizing the execution of the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency Project Modification Request Form for Enhancing Services 
the Berks County Victims Grant in the District Attorney's Office. Item C, adopt a resolution authorizing the reappointment of the following members of the Berks County Workforce Development Board for three year term beginning July 1, 2023 to June 30th, 2026. Number one, Ashley Chambers. Number two, Crystal Hauser. Number three, Peggy Kirshner. Number four, Scott Mengel. Number five, Mark Pinka Savage. Number six, Alexia Persley. Number seven, Patricia Shermont. Number eight, Karen Trox Troxel. And number nine, David Turner. Item D, adopt a resolution authorizing the vice chair to execute addendum number four to lease agreement by and between the County of Berks and J Fox Properties LLC, extending the lease of office space located at 26 Stroll Drive in Oli PA for an additional one month term from December 31, 2023 through January 31, 2024. And the uh, item needs to be corrected here rather than 22, it should be 2023 through January 31. Item E, adopt a resolution authorizing Daniel Height, Chief Probation Officer, to execute the multi-county agreement for juvenile detention bed utilization, an agreement among partner counties with Cornell Abraxas Group LLC for the use of a certain number of youth detention beds at Abraxas Academy, Academy Secure Detention, Berks County, Pennsylvania. Item number F, Adopt a resolution authorizing Larry Medallia, Deputy Chief Operations Officer, to execute the Abnormal Security Mutual Non-Disclosure Agreement between Abnormal Security Corporation and County of Berks to explore a business opportunity of mutual interest and disclose certain information. Item G, authorize the Vice Chair to execute an agreement between the County of Berks and the County of Wayne for the housing of juvenile offenders charged as adults subject to final approval of the terms and conditions by the solicitor's office. Item H, authorize the vice chair to execute an agreement between the County of Berks and the County of Cambria for the housing of juvenile offenders charged as adults subject to final approval of the terms and conditions of the solicitor's office. And item I, Authorize the vice chair to execute an agreement between the County of Berks and the County of Allegheny for the housing of juvenile offenders charged as adults subject to final approval of the terms and conditions by the solicitor's office. Just to mention item E, G, H, and I are because the county does not have facilities for these uh, services. So that's why we need to contract out with other counties or other third parties to be able to handle these services for us. Item number two is a motion to authorize execution of contract agreements and amendments as set forth on the contract agenda listed, listing dated June 19th of 2023. <clears throat> there are a total of 43 contracts. The Area Agency on Aging has 31 contracts. Assessment has one. Children and Youth Services has six. Department of Emergency Services has one, Facilities has one, Juvenile Probation has one, Parks has one, and the Berks Hine has one. And item number three is a motion to authorize execution of payments and electronic transfers for the week ending June 22nd, 2023. So moved. <laughs> I will second that. <laughs> Are there any comments or questions on the agenda? If none, all those in favor say aye. 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 None opposed, so the agenda is approved as presented with the exception of changing the date from 2022 to 2023 on the item I had mentioned. Okay, moving along, reports of treasurer and controller. Uh, is Sock on with us yet? Linda, um, can we have Linda on? Linda? Yes. <laughs> yep, go ahead. Good morning. We have an opening balance of 
$278,313,632.69. We have a balance to clear of $6,263,348.37, leaving us with a balance of $272,050,284.32. Okay, Linda, thank you very much. Moving on to Sandy Garifias, County Controller. Sandy. Well, we just have all kinds of stuff today. Going back to June the 6th, we had accounts payable of $9,517,991.14. We had a payroll of $5,168,151.86 for a grand total of $14,000,000. $686,143. That is the sixth. Now we'll do the 15th next. We had co total cash disbursements of $19,578,542.22. Now then, we'll do the 22nd. <laughs> I'll tell you what, we're, we're just getting rid of all kinds of good stuff today. We have a get to work account. today, Sandy. <laughs> we have a total accounts payable of six million three hundred seventy-five thousand seven hundred ten dollars and fifty-nine cents. We have a payroll five million thirty-one thousand five hundred eleven dollars and forty-two cents for a grand total of eleven million four hundred seven thousand two hundred twenty-two dollars and one cent. The end. Okay, Sandy, thank you very much. Moving along now to the report of the Chief Operations Officer. And uh, the COO is not here today, so we have our Deputy COO who will be presenting. Good morning, thank you, Commissioners. Uh, first, I'd like to start out by saying thank you for your approval of the Berks, I'm sorry, the Ag Center uh, contracts. As you know, this is the first major renovation to be done since those uh, or that campus was constructed back in the 1970s. Uh, this has been a program or a process that has been in the pipeline for quite a long time, and we're very pleased that uh, we can move ahead with that. So thank you. Uh, I also would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge Stephanie Weaver. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Stephanie Williams, who is the uh, interim County Library System Director, as uh, you mentioned, Commissioner Rivera, uh, Amy Resch, our former director, has uh, left to go on to Lycoming County and their library system. And uh, we're pleased to have Stephanie step in until uh, we're able to find a, a permanent replacement for Amy. Uh, next, I'd just like to uh, mention a couple of items. One on Tuesday the 27th uh, at 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., uh, the county commissioners will be hosting a town hall. Uh, that is an opportunity for the public to come meet, mix, mingle, and ask questions of the board and uh, get an opportunity to have some personal uh, face time with you all. Uh, I applaud you for doing that. Anytime you can get out to the public and see them uh, and they have the opportunity to ask questions, we think that's a good thing. Uh, no formal action is taken at that meeting. That is simply an informational session. Uh, however, on Thursday night, the 29th, uh, we will be taking the commissioners on the road, as you are aware. Uh, our stop this time is at Topton Borough Hall, and the meeting will begin at 7 p.m. And we hope uh, folks who live in the Topton area and in, in that area of the county will take the time to come out to Topton Borough Hall. And, uh, and the town hall session which is Tuesday night, is going to be held in the uh, Tulpahocken Library. And those doors will open at 6 p.m. And that is the extent of my report. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. We will move on now to Commissioner's comments. Commissioner Leinbach is not here today. So we will start with Commissioner Sahelnik. Thank you, Commissioner Rivera, um, and I will try to keep this brief as it has been a long meeting, uh, but I do want to um, bring uh, awareness to the public. Uh, let's start with the Berks County Public Library since we um, wish Amy Resch good luck and welcome Stephanie um, into her position. Uh, 
let's talk about the story walks. Uh, they are happening now and just a really phenomenal way to get families out and involved and walking. Um, there is the Summer Arboretum Story Walk on the grounds of the Reading Public Museum. Uh, and that book will be Dance Like a Flamingo. Uh, there will be a ribbon cutting coming uh, on Tuesday, August 1st. Uh, for a story walk grand opening at the Nature Place with Burke's Nature, that's off of Route 10. Uh, and then I know that there are other story walks in the community like um, Boyertown. Uh, so if you have the opportunity and an open Saturday and you want to go spend it strolling Boyertown and look at the bears, you can also do a story walk there. So get out and see Berks County um, utilizing the story walk programs that are in place. Um, in addition, uh, there are some fun things going on at the Reading Public Library. I'm um, sorry, the Reading Public Museum. Uh, Robot Zoo is now open. Uh, and again, a lot of my comments might be germane to the fact that I have a five year old uh, and we live here in Berks County and we look for things to do, especially on days when it's uh, like today, a little overcast, a little rainy. So I highly recommend Robot Zoo for everybody of all ages. Um, in addition to the regular exhibits, um, the summer program, Programs and the Carlos Luna exhibit, which just opened. There was a beautiful reception this week. Um, we are lucky to have that exhibit. I highly recommend that as well for um, people of uh, older, more mature ages. Uh, I know that Commissioner Rivera is going to speak a little bit to what's going on through the Department of Agriculture. So the only thing I really want to touch on there uh, is that June is recognized as Dairy Month. Um, so please make sure to um, support and do your part to support our dairies and that um, agricultural sector that is so prevalent and strong here in Berks County to us. Um, maybe go get some ice cream or have some chocolate milk. Um, and I think uh, the Berks County Park System is something that I like to speak about. Uh, there is a toddler trail camp that has been going on this week. Some of these are uh, low cost or free uh, programming to the community, which is always um, important. Uh, there's essential essentials of rail trail riding. Uh, Yoakum Institute is hosting Be Curious on Saturday, June 24th, depending on the weather. Of course, there's a lot of things that are dependent happening in the community. Park Ranger Paddle is happening on June 27th. Uh, sneak peek into July, which is right around the corner. Uh, there's some great programming, drop-in art programs, history, fun with fibers. So take a look from our website, countyofberks.com. Um, you can download these really graphic friendly schedules. In addition to, I think there is an events calendar um, and uh, there's an upcoming skate park um, camp, uh, a skateboarding camp that's coming up. So just a lot of cool things to do, right? So um, that being said, one of the significant things um, that I believe is our obligation and opportunity um, is to make recognition of um, federal holidays and things that are significant for all our community members. And so today I'm really um, pleased and honored to uh, really be able to speak on behalf of all of us commissioners um, on the recognition of Juneteenth that has occurred this week. Uh, and so for those um, who may not be aware, uh, 158 years ago on June 19th, 1865, more than two years after the Emancipation Proclamation was issued, Union soldiers rode into Galveston, which I'm familiar with because I have family and we go to Galveston, Texas. And this is where they informed hundreds of thousands of enslaved African Americans that the Civil War was over. So this was the action that took place and a call to action. And although this was a delayed action, they were finally granted freedom and had the opportunity to pursue a better life for themselves and their families and their loved ones and the generations that would follow. We commemorate this day as Juneteenth which marks the liberation of enslaved people in America and serves as a reminder of new beginnings and the possibility of hope for the future. 
In that spirit, it's my pleasure to announce that this past Monday, in acknowledgement of Juneteenth 2023, we, the Berks County Commissioners, were in discussions with county personnel to declare Juneteenth as a County of Berks holiday beginning in 2024. The designation would align with the recent federal and state recognition of the holiday. It is hard to imagine that some people were not aware of Juneteenth even just two years ago. So this really is a recognition and awareness um, to the public to recognize this federal, now federally designated holiday. The commissioners have directed the county solicitor's office and human resources department, and I thank them both for working diligently on this, to take the necessary steps to work towards implementing this holiday into the official county calendar beginning 2024. So I won't be here, um, but I certainly will be acknowledging with all county employees next year um, the observance of Juneteenth. Once those steps are complete, the commissioners will take formal action on the matter at a future Board of Commissioners meeting. So today we uh, channel the hope of a better future and we use that to drive our work to make Berks better. And just to note, if this is the first time that you're hearing about Juneteenth, please look it up talk about it with your families, become familiar with the observance of the holiday uh, and what it means um, to members of our community here in Berks County. Thank you very much. Okay, hey, thank you, Commissioner Sahonik. I have a few comments here. Uh, one this past Monday, all three of us, Commissioner Sahonik, Commissioner Leinbach and myself were able to go down uh, here in the area behind Rack where the Schuylkill River Sojourn made a stop for lunch. A uh, few things about the Schuylkill River Sojourn. This is the 25th year anniversary, uh, so it was really special for them. They had 250 participants. Of the 250 participants, 175 of them were new this year. Uh, and also there was a participant as far as California who came to do the sojourn with her grandfather who is 82 years old. Uh, so that's uh, really interesting. Just for those of you that, that don't know, the sojourn is an annual 112 mile guided canoe or kayak trip on the Schuylkill River that begins in rural Schuylkill Haven and ends seven days later in Philadelphia's Boathouse Row and participants paddle 14 to 18 miles per day down the river. They'll stop, they'll have uh, lunch, then they'll stop, they'll have dinner, they'll, they can either camp, there's the camp uh, site there, or they can stay at a hotel. You can either do the full seven days of the sojourn, or you can do one day or two days or three days, whatever you wanted to do. We were going to do a uh, part on Monday, but due to some other conflicts, we were not able to participate. But this is something that's been going on for 25 years. So if you want to uh, consider it for next year, make sure you put it on your calendar and uh, more information. You can go to the Schuylkill River Green one, my computer here, but it is not working. It's not cooperating today. There's a low, a Berks County local food map uh, there. I don't know if uh, I, it helps you connect with local farmers, growers and other agriculture re related businesses throughout the county and it's an online uh, local food map. So you can go online and you can look for either local uh, wineries or uh, grass fed beef or your own produce or specialized honey. Uh, many different things that are done and are local here to Berks County. And the website is growtogetherberks.com slash directory. Again, growtogetherberks.com directory. You can download this on your phone that way when you're out and about driving around uh, on an evening, on a weekend, and you say, you know what, I really like a local glass of wine or I like some local honey. I lo like some uh, local produce. You can pull that out. Uh, different farmers or growers on there. If you know of someone that is not on there, there's a way that you can have them added to it as well. So this is a great opportunity to use our local food producers. Again, it's growtogetherberks.com. Another thing having to do with our local agriculture is uh, the Barnopoly. Barnopoly started June 19th, started three days ago with the kickoff, and it runs two months through August the 19th. This is similar, if you can see here, to the uh, Monopoly game, but it's Barnopoly. And uh, 
BARN stands for Burks Agricultural Resource Network. If you go to the back of the card, you can see the different participating uh, either farmers or producers here in the area. And there's different ones uh, that you, they're color coded in here. So please uh, go and pick this out. You can get more information also at burksag.org backslash barnopoly. Again, burksag.org barnopoly. These are different ways to help promote our local ag community, which is many of you may know, it is the number one industry by gross revenue here in Berks County. And Larry already mentioned this, but I do want to remind everyone that next week our board meeting will be at the borough of Topton at 205 South Kelly Hill Road in, Road in Topton at 7 p.m. It is our quarterly commissioners on the road meeting. So uh, Adrian, don't show up here at 10 o'clock next week. We're at 7 p.m. All right. <laughs> OK, those are all my comments. Do I have any comments by any of the row officers? OK, none. We will move along to public comment. We have no in-person comments and we have two uh, online comments. So Barbara, will you read the two online comments? Maria Olipa. Where will the housing be located and what counties will be sending juveniles to Berks? What is the reason to create that in our county? John Miller, Burnville. Thank you, commissioners, for the recognition of Juneteenth. It is a wonderful opportunity for all Americans to appreciate the progress of our nation towards a more perfect union. OK, so we had two comments. Barbara, thank you for reading those two comments and Maria and John, thank you for your comments. Uh, to Maria, uh, not sure what housing you are talking about. We did not have any housing items on our agenda today of uh, anything that is being done here in Berks County. Uh, I don't recall anything about sending juveniles to Berks County either. Uh, the items that we did have on the agenda related to housing Juveniles were items uh, 232, 233, and 234, uh, which is authorizing us to execute, execute an agreement with three other counties to house juvenile offenders in their county, uh, not here in Berks County. So I'm not sure what you are referring to. Uh, Maria, if you one further clarification, you can feel free to call my office and we can speak uh, further about that. So those are the only uh, juvenile and housing items that we have on our agenda today. Commissioner Selnick, anything to add? Okay, so that ends our meeting. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you. Longest meeting. Yeah.